It's so nice to be doing another session of the Botany Bistro with all of you. And I'm very excited about today's topic. Um, before we get into that though, I just wanted to say thank you for tuning in and I hope you're having a wonderful week. And if you have weekend plans that you're excited about, I hope those go well. Um, just a little introduction to the series. My name is Mary Dudley and I am teaching you from the Civic Garden Center, which is in Cincinnati, Ohio. I have been working at the Civic Garden Center uh, for just about a year um, in my current position as the Ecology Education Manager. And before that, I uh, enjoyed teaching little ones during youth education and also um, as an intern. So uh, I have worked with the Civic Garden Center many years, uh, many different iterations, and I'm very excited about this series that we're providing for free. And we will have all of our recordings archived on our Botany Bistro page. So if you would like to see those, go to www.civicgardencenter.org and you can access all of our sessions. Um, so this program really is developed in a way for us to be able to communicate botanical knowledge and share that freely so that people are empowered to understand about plants and ways that plants function so that they can grow healthy gardens and maintain healthy landscapes. And so that's what we're all about here at the Civic Garden Center. Uh, this is our fourth Botany Bistro session. And so our previous series focused on being uh, attentive to what botany is in general, what local botany is happening in the Cincinnati area, um, and also what bigger projects lie ahead in the world of botany. And so it was a really nice series, so if you need to catch up, be sure to um, visit our archive. So this session kicks off a two-part series about plant morphology and um, there are many sub-disciplines within botany, uh, and so this is the first sub-discipline that we'll dive into. And this is not an exhaustive review of plant morphology in any means, so this is just a little taste uh, to wet your whistle. And if you would like to go down the rabbit hole um, later on your own, I think you'll find a lot of really interesting information. Um, but plant morphology, uh, we're going to talk today specifically about leaves uh, and growth habits of plants. And then our part two is going to focus on flowers and how the reproductive structures of plants are classified. Um, every session we kick off with a little bit of what's for lunch. And so my lunch today, uh, you probably guessed it, is a nice salad, lovely greens. And I put some carrots in there too. So uh, just a little bit of nice color. Mm, so yummy. I hope you're all enjoying your own lunches um, and thinking about the botany that's behind your ingredients. Um, we're going to continue this session on July 28th. So I just wanna make sure that you have that on your calendar. Uh, we will see you every other Friday. And so we'll pick that up. And so let's jump in. What is plant morphology? Um, well, very strictly speaking, very simply speaking, it is the study of the external visible organs and structure of plants. And so for many years before the advent of genetic testing, uh, we could only use uh, what we could see. Um, about plants and so now we're able to really get into the internal structures more and think about how the genetics are all tied in together um, but basically just seeing what we could see um, at first with the unaided eye and then later through microscopic um, tools we were able to see a lot about plants and uh, devised a whole system of organization for plants based on these external structures. Um, I will say that knowledge of plant morphology will help identify plants and so having a basic fundamental knowledge of ways that plants are arranged and different types of shapes, um, sizes, things like that are really going to give you a leg up when you are thinking about 
identifying a plant. I know that lots of us have these wonderful apps now on our phones that can identify plants uh, in less time than it takes to even take a picture sometimes. Um, but if we're not taking accurate photos or um, cataloging you know, the really important details of those species, even our apps can have a hard time uh, making accurate definitions. And so uh, I used to carry around a backpack of books with me uh, into the field, lots of different field guides, trying to make sure that I could identify different plants. Um, it's so nice to now have essentially those books just on my phone. Um, but I do notice that if I don't take a quality picture, um, I am not getting the results that I want. And so this will help you uh, do that a little bit. And maybe you could skip the app sometimes when you're, oh, I know what that plant is and I can identify it. Um, so before we get into talking about leaves, um, I do want to talk a little bit about growth habit um, and the way that plants grow will give you a little bit of an insight on um, what that plant needs to be healthy and to survive. Um, and so when we're looking at a plant, uh, there's parts of that plant that we cannot see, right? So I'm thinking specifically about their root structure. Uh, typically that is not going to be visible. And so uh, it's not unimportant to understand that root structure. It's just not necessarily the first thing that people think about when they think about identifying a plant or looking at a plant. Um, and so understanding how those root structures work is going to be important for the novice to expert gardener. And so um, we've talked a little bit in this class about uh, different types of plants, but I'll review. There in the vascular plant kingdom, there are two main groups of plants. Um, you have gymnosperms and angiosperms, and these are um, going to be differentiated in their reproductive structures. And so we're gonna be mostly focusing on angiosperms, which are flowering plants today. Uh, and within that group, there are two other fairly large groups, subcategories of dicots and monocots. And most dicots are going to have a taproot system, um, which has kind of a large feeder root that goes down. Uh, this is why I chose carrots today for lunch. Uh, and so it has this beautiful tap root that um, doesn't have a lot of lateral roots. It's kind of, it, it almost looks singular. It's not, it does have some small lateral roots. Um, but most of our dicotyledons are going to have uh, that main tap root. Whereas our monocots, which are our grasses, uh, they have more fibrous root systems. And so uh, paying attention to that is very important. Now, that being said, uh, we are going to talk quite a bit about trees. And I don't want to give anyone the impression that trees just have this one carrot type root. Um, they have many, many roots, many lateral roots. Uh, I often have people ask me about planting under trees. And I discourage um, them from doing that unless they know how that root structure is formed because you can do quite a bit of damage to a tree uh, by working around on top of roots. And so we really wanna make sure that we're respecting the parts of the plant that we cannot see. Um, and in a lot of times it is equal to the shoot system above ground that we can see, or even maybe more extensive. Um, and so having the right mindset to understand that there's things happening that we're not sure about is a great way to um, just come into a botanical atmosphere uh, with eyes wide open and ready for questions. Um, so thinking about those roots systems, which is uh, definitely a part of morphology. Um, I don't think that we'll be talking a lot about roots today, but roots are pretty fascinating and there can be opportunities for them to be storage organs. They can um, create new plants, um, clones of the main plant and really neat stuff. Um, for roots, but today we're going to focus more on the shoot system, which is the above ground that we can see. And so when you're looking at a shoot system, uh, most of us think of stems and leaves. Um, those are the earlier things that we see. Those roots are already starting to develop. That's the first part of the plant that develops after germination. 
Um, and so that root is supporting that shoot system while that develops. And then once it can start to photosynthesize, um, then it feeds those roots. Uh, and hopefully that plant has enough stored energy to be able to make it to that point. Um, but that shoot system has leaves, stems, and then eventually may develop flowers and fruits. Um, but there's also different parts of those stems and leaves. So let's focus on that a little bit. Um, and so the architecture of a plant uh, is either going to be herbaceous or woody. Um, and so our herbaceous plants are ones that do not develop a woody stem. Uh, they're typically annuals. Um, in our region, they die back usually with our winters. Um, and then they'll regrow. If it's a perennial, they can regrow from a bulb or another type of storage organ. Um, or you would need to plant those seeds again. Versus perennials, like our trees and our shrubs, that have woody features that help them hold up during uh, our kind of harsher seasons. And so uh, in, as plants are growing, they have growing points and they have um, areas where they will start to branch, start to bud, um, and they also have internodes where they don't have new growth happening. So you'll see uh, a, a place of growth and then another place of growth and in between those two places we call that an internode. Uh, if you are an experienced pruner, you probably understand that it's very important to know where these nodes are, these growing points, because you would want to prune just above a growing point. Um, you wouldn't want to leave the internode to be a spot for possible infection, um, disease. You would always want to make sure that you're pruning right above your nodes. So the next time you go out and take a close look at a plant, I highly recommend that you try to find those interspaces where growth is happening uh, on either end and then you have that little spot in the middle. Um, so I'm not going to talk a lot more about axillary growth or tissues. We're going to save that um, for plant anatomy and physiology. Uh, so we're just focused on what we can see with our eyes today. Um, and so these are the main parts of the plants that we've reviewed. And so looking at a plant you can also take a step back and look at the growth habit of a plant. Um, now this is the three-dimensional shape or silhouette outline, and it's determined by branching pattern. Um, I often get to see the best types of growth habits during the winter when the leaves are not present, and you can really see some beautiful patterns of plants. Um, and so for an example, uh, we have lots of names for everything. Botanists have lots of names for everything. Um, there is an X current growth habit that has single or undivided trunks and they can produce um, a pyramid shape form. And so it's important to know what types of plants have that because if you were to prune or to have damage to a tree that had that type of growth habit, then you would not be able to, re typically not be able to reestablish that pyramidal form. Um, so paying attention to that is very important. Um, that's Western red cedar, Douglas fir, they have those types of forms. Um, other types of forms include vase shapes. So uh, this is something that's important when we're thinking about the placement of trees. Particularly, uh, we appreciate vase shaped trees um, that kind of, you know, have this little vase shape. It doesn't have a lot of lateral branches real low. Um, and so they can create a canopy without having over, like lower hanging branches. And so American elm is a really good example of that. Uh, sadly, American elm uh, has been decimated by Dutch elm disease. And so this once popular street tree, um, which was chosen for its growth habit, because you're able to drive under it and walk under it um, is not a option anymore to be planting in our landscapes. And so we're constantly thinking and, and learning new things, but also trying to find replacements for plants that um, we once used in our landscape. And so um, we have several different types of growth shapes that are pretty common. Columnar, which are pretty straight up and down. Um, also upright, 
Um, then you have your spreaders. And so um, I'm thinking like an oak tree in a field by itself has this beautiful spreading branching pattern and will typically have branches fairly low to the ground. These are your good climbing trees, right? Um, and so you can get onto them. I also really enjoy weeping growth habits. Um, so those are like your willows, um, things that are pendulous. There are lots of horticultural cultivars that are weeping, um, that have a style of that. And so um, you can find different growth habits and you can also manipulate plants into a growth habit that you might enjoy. Now that is going to be a little bit more difficult um, depending on what types of plants you choose. Some plants take very well to being put into a rounded shape, other plants not so much. Um, so you might have to do a little bit of research on your own, but uh, there are lots of people that like to shape their plants. Um, topiary is something I haven't gotten into, uh, but understanding these structures will help you be able to do those practices. Um, so we talked a little bit about these forms, these growth habits. Um, you also have things like um, lianas, which are woody vines or herbaceous vines are another option. You have things that you might have heard of like dwarf plants that are grown to not go over a certain height. Um, now all of these things are kind of loose um, when you're thinking about your particular landscape. So you have to remember that um, plants don't read the textbook, <laughs> they don't read the description on the nursery website. Um, and so like I said, that oak that likes to be out in the field by itself with these large lateral branches, if that oak was growing in a wooded area, uh, and it didn't have sunlight available at that low level, it had to get up above the understory, it would not start laterally branching uh, until it was able to really take advantage of the sun's energy and photosynthesize. So that same tree would look very different in a confined habitat with more neighbors than it would out in a field by itself. Um, and that's just something that is really neat about plant adaptations. Um, and so looking at the tree shape is very important, that the plant shape is an important way to I start to identify. Um, the second thing that you can look at is the stem, the bark. We're not gonna get a lot into stems either. Um, I wish there was just a million hours in the day we could talk about all these wonderful things. Um, but we are gonna just, I'm gonna mention that the bark can be a good way to identify plants, especially those that have that uh, very telltale exfoliation. Um, that's gonna be your sycamores, your river birches. You can see those um, kind of puzzle pieces of the bark falling and sometimes peeling off. You can peel them off yourself. Uh, and then uh, that really tells you what it is. Um, there's other trees that have good telltale bark once you start to look. The furrows, um, the colors in between the furrows, the ridges. Some bark is smooth, like a beech tree. Um, and so that's a good characteristic to tell. And um, I've heard often that people want to know more about winter identification uh, of plants. And so getting to know your barks is important. At first, it might seem like everything looks the same, um, but eventually you might see some different arrangements. Um, persimmon trees have this beautiful kind of block shapes in their bark. Um, so really take some time and let your brain slowly start to see those subtle differences. Um, the other thing that you can use before the leaves come out uh, is thinking about the leaf scars or the buds, the presence of buds, which would be the places where new leaves would grow. Um, so leaf scars happen when we have our deciduous trees starting to um, lose their leaves. And so it leaves a little scar where that vascular bundle was. Now we did talk a little bit about xylem and phloem in the last session, um, but again, that's an internal plant process. So I'm gonna hold off on that for today, uh, but it does leave a visible mark. Um, and so I wonder what some of our very early botanists might have thought about some of the things that they were seeing before they understood uh, the internal processes of plants. Um, but some leaf scars are very telling. Um, for example, black walnut uh, and other walnut species have a very identifiable leaf scar that you can look up. Um, some people say it looks like a face. 
uh, is, is a very interesting thing to look at. Um, and so now that we've talked a little bit about habit and uh, some of the things you can use to identify when the leaves might not be out, let's jump into leaves. Um, and leaves are just so beautiful. <laughs> I think that the variation and the diversity um, really are endless and it is inspiring to see all the different changes and adaptations that leaves have in order to fulfill their function, uh, which really is to capture sunlight and also divert rain uh, so that it comes right to the roots when it needs to. And so uh, leaves have several different characteristics that we can use for identification. Um, one of the first things that you can look at is going to be the veination on the leaf. And so just like we have veins, leaves have veins, they've got to get water around, they've got to move those sugars. Um, and so they have these beautiful vein patterns. If you've ever done a leaf rubbing, um, which is where you would put the leaf under a piece of paper and use a crayon or a colored pencil to um, moderately go over it, uh, you'd be able to see that venation pattern. And it's just very intricate. And what we can see with our naked eye is you know, less than half of the story. Um, but there are different ways that you can tell what types of plants are based on these patterns. And so um, I mentioned that those monocots, those grasses, tend to have parallel veins. And so you can see that that also happens with lilies. Um, you also have pinnate venation, where the veins will extend from the midrib uh, to the leaf margin, which is the edge of the leaf. We call that the margin. Um, oak and cherry trees have this, and it's kind of like a little ladder. And then palmate venation uh, is the third main type, and that's when veins radiate in a sh fan shape from the leaf petiole. And this happens in maple and sweet gum leaves. Um, and so you can see those different types of venation. So you're taking a close look at the leaf, you're taking a look at the venation, um, and then you need to think about the arrangement of the leaves on the stem, um, as well as the leaf itself. And so uh, this is important because you really need to understand what constitutes a leaf on different species or else you're going to get even your best favorite identification app uh, a little bit goofed up. <laughs> so um, we're going to talk about the two patterns of division of leaves, which are simple and compound. Um, a simple leaf is a singular leaf shape that is connected to the stem via a petiole. Um, and so you'll also be able to identify that um, it has got one blade on it. Um, otherwise, you're thinking about a compound leaf, and it is optionally, it could be pinnately compound or palmately compound. Um, palmate tends to, you know, we think about our hand and the way that that is arranged. Pinnately compound are leaflets that are arranged on a stalk, um, called a rachis typically, and it's an extension of the petiole. Um, an example of something that's pinnately compound would be like hickory, a walnut, pecan, uh, box elder, black locust. Those are all pinnately compound. Um, and palmately compound is going to be like your buckeyes and your horse chestnuts. Um, and so those leaflets radiate outwards from the center, similar to the way that we discussed that same term for venation. Um, and so our simple leaves could be lobed. You know, they could still have little sections kind of cut out in them, um, but it is just going to be one single blade that is undivided. Uh, now, we've kind of simplified that a little bit. If you go and do some research, you'll notice that there are leaves that are twice pinnately compound, uh, thrice. <laughs> you could have leaves that are, are compound upon compound upon compound. Um, and so knowing how to tell what is a leaf and what is a leaflet is really going to help you a lot. Um, so for example, when you're thinking about um, taking a picture for your app, if you just take a picture of a leaflet, then that app probably won't have all the information that it needs to identify that full leaf and that full species. So for example, I'm holding now a plant that has compound leaves um, and I can tell 
that I'm looking at one singular leaf because of how this is arranged on the stem, it will have a growing node right at the space where the petiole attaches to the stem or the branch or the trunk. And so that node is typically swollen. Um, typically petioles are going to be that part between the leaf blade and the stem. And um, it can be short, it can be long, it can be colorful, um, but understanding how to identify that growing node. Remember we have nodes and internodes. So you have a growing node, you have a petiole, and then what comes off of that petiole is the leaf. Each leaflet is attached to this part um, where it's attached does not have a swollen node. And so it's pretty easy to identify on some plants. Other plants can be very tricky, um, but on most plants you'll be able to identify, oh, this is a growing node. This is leading to a compound leaf. Um, so take a little bit of time to think about that. Once you have identified if it is simple or compound, you'll be able to see how it is arranged on the stem. And so we have three main ways that that can happen. It can be alternately arranged, oppositely arranged, or whirled, that's W-H-O-R-L-E-D, uh, which means that it has more than one uh, leaflet or leaf coming out of the same growing node. Uh, those are a little bit rarer, but um, definitely still out there. And so finding one that has world leaves is really exciting. Uh, we don't have a lot of oppositely uh, arranged species in our region, um, but our maples do that. And so uh, if you have a maple tree close to you, you can see when it's opposite, it's just like it says, they're arranged directly across from each other. Um, and then alternate would be at different heights um, alternating up the stem. And so you can think about the way the leaf is arranged. So just, I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but <laughs> we've talked about um, leaf venation, we've talked about the compound and simple, and we've talked about stem arrangement. Um, let's go back to that petiole um, so that you have some reference for that. And so um, you might be able to identify on your own plants at home um, those leaf scars that we mentioned, and that's where the petiole um, removed it. That's where it was removed from the stem. Um, and so when that gets cut off um, and separated during the time of leaf fall, uh, you'll see that space. And so if you're able to look at a plant over and over over time, uh, you'll be able to identify where those petioles are. Um, and now there are plants that we are very familiar with that have awesome petioles. Uh, rhubarb, uh, we eat the petiole. We actually don't eat, um, you know, the leaf or the root typically. We're going to be eating that nice red petiole, so delicious early in the springtime. Celery um, and cardoons are also our petioles that we eat um, and cultivated as edible crops. So. I want you to think about the petiole as um, it's an important part of the plant structure. It's not uh, something that we can ignore. So even though it seems very small, uh, it's doing a lot of important things covering up that growing tip. And so identifying that node, that petiole, um, and then you're going on to your leaf ID. So after that, we can think about our leaf shape. Um, and so there are so many botanical terms for leaf shapes. Um, it, it can, it could, it's, it's a little bit overkill, but it's okay. Um, every, every leaf is very special. And so we have some main shapes, um, that leaves can have. And so they can be, um, lobed, they can be obovate, ovate, linear, lanceolate. Um, we have all these different types of ways to explain leaf shape. We have terms for the way the bottom of the leaf or leaflet is shaped versus the way the top is shaped. Um, and then we have different terms for uh, the width and the way that um, it curves around or, or is lobed. Uh, so I won't go into all of the vocabulary, but there are dozens of terms that people use to describe leaves. Um, and they are all very particular as they need to be because we have such wonderful diversity in our woods and gardens.
Um, now, leaf shape also can be influenced by environment. And so leaves that are in full sun tend to be smaller than leaves that are in shade. Um, and again, it's just based on that function that they're trying to fulfill. You want your leaf to be able to have enough surface area to have enough uh, input of solar energy so that it can make enough food for itself. And so if it's growing in shade, typically those leaves are a little bit larger to fulfill that function. Um, now you'll also want to think about what influences leaf growing um, because you have maybe plants that have variegated leaves. And so those are usually bred horticultural specimens um, and they will have different shapes than possibly their more natural um, cousins, I guess you'd say. Uh, and so we also have plants that don't have a singular leaf shape. Uh, so for example, sassafras has three distinct leaf shapes on it. Uh, it has leaves that are twice lobed, leaves that are singularly lobed, and leaves that are not lobed at all. And we would say that that was entire. Um, and so we can have some uh, general consensus on uh, shapes and how that works, uh, but there's always a plant or two out there that is just trying to be a rebel, and so we've got to um, expect that too. Um, one of the last things that we'll talk about today are leaf margins, um, and so understanding that the shape, the venation, the arrangement are all very important indicators of a species as you identify. The margin is that outer edge. And so we have several different terms for what's going on on that outer edge. When I'm looking at a leaf margin, I appreciate the use of a magnifier. Um, there are very subtle things that you might not notice with the naked eye. Um, and I, I just appreciate that little bit of magnification help. Um, because if it is smooth, that's totally different than having uh, little teeth, little indentations on it. And sometimes it's hard to see those. Um, so paying attention to that for sure. And so leaf margins are, um, there's a, more than a dozen different types, um, but we'll just go through a couple simple ones. Um, a leaf can be entire if it is smooth around the entire edge. So examples of this would be magnolia or dogwood species. Uh, toothed is another or serrated and that means that it has a series of pointed teeth around the entire leaf blade. Um, elm and mulberry are examples of this uh, and then lobed is another main group of that and so that means that the margin has some indentations that go uh, about halfway or less to the midrib or midline. Uh, maple and oak leaves are very good examples of lobed leaves. Now that in consideration can say, oh, well, you know, this oak tree has lobes, but also teeth. Um, and so there can be multiple characteristics on a single leaf um, if we really take our chance to look. And so I have been very impressed with particularly our oaks in the area. There are over 90 species of oak that call the United States home. Um, there are upwards of almost 500 species that have been documented around the globe over time. And uh, the variation and diversity just in that one genus of plants is wild. It is very <laughs> varied. So you have some that look like um, willow leaves, like very lanceolate, linear leaves. Um, you have other that are deeply lobed. You have some that have rounded lobes, like our white oak group, and some that have um, points on the ends, and so that's gonna be our red oaks. Uh, but they're just very, very interesting to look at all the different types of even uh, diversity in that particular group. Um, so let's talk a little bit about unique leaf types uh, before we get into our homework for today. Um, spines are modified leaves, and so in certain situations, plants are going to need to protect themselves from herbivory, from herbivores, um, and they're also just going to need a, play, a way to uh, adapt to a different environment. So, for example, in cacti, spines are transformed leaves uh, that protect the plant and also radiate heat 
from the stem during the day uh, and collect and drip condensed water vapor during cool nights. Um, so talk about like a leaf that's doing triple duty. Now in most of our cacti, because the leaf is modified in this way, the stem then takes on the responsibility of photosynthesis, which is why the stem tends to be green and have chloroplasts uh, present. And so uh, those leaves are not able to perform their original function, but they are doing so many other important things for that plant. Um, other plants, such as stone plants, those are the lithops and aloe, uh, develop succulent leaves that can store water. Um, and so the leaf examples that I brought today are not adapted in that way. Um, they do transpire and they do have some water in them, but they are not adapted to be a storage organ like succulent leaves are. Uh, we also have leaf bases that can form underground into bulbs like tulips and crocuses um, and they can be storage for food or water or both um, but technically those are leaves that have been modified uh, to be able to make sure that, that plant is successful um, carnivorous plants are always a favorite especially working with the young ones and um, those plants have modified leaves that will attract and trap insects um, now, technically speaking, these plants are not eating insects. Um, they are digesting them and using their proteins and their nutrients uh, because these plants tend to live in very nutrient poor environments. And so they really are just kind of capturing those species uh, in order to break them down. So, whoo, <laughs> the whole wide world of leaves out there. Um, and so just to review all the, all the things you now know that you can take with you next time you're walking in the garden or your yard or the woods, um, thinking about growth habit, thinking about um, the way and shape that plants have, understanding that there is a large component of the plant that we cannot see um, that is doing a lot of work, those root systems, um, thinking about leaf arrangement, veins, um, identifying the petiole and the shape and leaf margin. Um, sometimes that is all you're going to need to identify a plant. Um, and so it's a really great way to start being a plant morphologist, uh, just taking a close look. So your homework for this week um, is to collect three leaves that show different shapes and margins. Um, and then to create some leaf rubbings. We'd love for you to take pictures and show us, share on our social media and tag Civic Garden Center. Um, but this activity might seem very simple, uh, but it does really reveal a lot about leaves. And so if you're interested in being a botanist and collecting things and starting your own um, journal, nature journals, uh, the experts do this too. Professionals do leaf rubbings in the field. It keeps you from having to carry around a lot of plant material. It enables you to have a life-size exact replica of the leaf so that you can take it back to the lab and, and really do some identification work. Um, also on days when you might be out for a long period of time, even if you collected a specimen, uh, it might not be able to be studied well if it has dried or crinkled up. Um, so making sure that we have all those little pieces there, um, we don't want to forget about the simple leaf rubbing, uh, which will give us so much information about that plant uh, for the future. All right, so that was our day today. Um, I am going to uh, go ahead and open up the chat. And so if you have any questions, um, you can go ahead and put those in. But I just want to say thank you all so much for joining today. And I really look forward to talking with you about flowers next time.